about the suffering and the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's all good, it's all perfect, it's all profitable, but scripture has mountaintops. Scripture has places that are unforgettable. Scripture has one great mountain which looms over all the rest, and that great mountain is God's promised Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything before him pointed to him, everything after him points either back to his identity and his work or forward to his coming in glory. We're on holy ground. Of all the marvelous words in scripture, of all the marvelous words, even in the gospels about the Lord Jesus Christ, the highest mountaintop is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In isolation, the suffering and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ looks like the greatest defeat ever, the greatest defeat in history, the Son of God humiliated and killed by his own creation. In reality, the crucifixion is the greatest victory in history. Life for his people was won on that cross. Let's pray. Ask God to help us. Father, I thank you that by the wounds of your son, an undeserving, unworthy people are healed and reconciled and made fit for glory. We have nothing without the death of your son. We are on holy ground. Oh, in a figurative sense, let our shoes be off and our faces on the ground before you to feed our souls on the atoning death of your son that makes peace between a holy God and sinners. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The structure of my time is going to be this. Number one. I'll be speaking about the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. In other words, we have four Gospels and we have four Gospel accounts of what happened when Jesus suffered and died. I'll, I'll be bringing those together and just telling us what we've heard many times before. But we should look, we should gaze upon that. Number two, I'll speak of the meaning of his suffering and death. Jesus suffering and dying means things. And I'll be speaking about that. And then thirdly and finally, I'll be applying his, su his suffering and death. His, his suffering and death makes a world of difference to you, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. So I'll be speaking of the significance for us as individuals. Number one, the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm, act, I'm asking us to consider the history. This is a history, a specific history, a, a true history of, of a real man who lived in, in time. And I'm pulling together from all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John all have detailed descriptions, but somewhat different descriptions of Jesus' suffering and Jesus' crucifixion. So, so what I'm giving you now is bringing them, them together in one view. Beginning with Gethsemane, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus agonized. Matthew 26, 37 says he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Jesus was, was pleading with his father to take the cup away from him. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The agony was such that Jesus was sweating drops of sweat like drops of blood. He was deeply sorrowful. He was deeply distressed. He was pleading with his father. 
That he wouldn't have to do that thing which was right before him. That thing which his father had sent him to do. That thing which, his, which he himself had voluntarily come to do. Jesus was betrayed by a false friend, Judas, with a kiss. A, a sign of intimate friendship in the, in the eastern nations. A kiss was a sign of the most intimate friendship. It was the sign, not, be, not because it would be un, unusual, but because it wouldn't be unusual. Th that was the sign of betrayal because Jesus' pattern was to share this, this sign of intimate friendship with all of his disciples, Judas being included, uh, included in, the, in that. No one would have suspected Jesus or Judas from for kissing Jesus. That's the whole point. It was a close friend. Jesus was apprehended as if he were a common criminal in Matthew 26, 55. Jesus says, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? They didn't need a mob. They didn't need swords and clubs. He had been in the temple courts teaching every day that week. They had never approached him to apprehend him. When they apprehended him, Matthew 26, 56 says, all the disciples forsook him and fled. So he's been forsaken by a false friend and now, excuse me, he's been betrayed by a false friend and now forsaken by true friends. They all fled. The mob bound Jesus and led him to the high priest. The high priest and the Sanhedrin, the, the, the religious ruling council, of the professing people of God sought and entertained false testimony against him. He was the sinless son of God. They could never have found one person in his life to give true testimony of wrongdoing that Jesus had ever done, even if they could have found a witness of his thoughts, could have never found one that would give true testimony that would condemn the Lord Jesus Christ. So the high priest and the Sanhedrin, this ruling council, sought and entertained false testimony to get what they wanted. During the proceedings, one of the officers struck Jesus with the palm of his hand because he thought one of his answers was disrespectful to the high priest. He slapped the Son of God. Jesus' answer was sinless. Yet this man slapped the Son of God. Jesus did not bring down the weight of heaven upon this man, but he bore it patiently as a sheep before its shearers is silent. Jesus opened not his mouth. He bore it patiently. That officer that struck him, uh, the Sanhedrin, the members of the Sanhedrin condemned him to death. And then they spat in his face and then they beat him and they blindfolded him and they struck him with the palms of their hands. And they said, mockingly prophesy to us, Christ. Who is the one who struck you? Jesus was denied three times by a true friend, a close, close friend. When you read the Gospels. You can never miss that Peter was closer to him than most. So now he has been betrayed by a false friend, forsaken by true friends, denied three times by a close, close friend. Peter cursed and swore that he didn't know Jesus. I do not know the man. And then he knew what he had done was so wretched that Matthew and Mark and Luke say the same thing. They say that he went out immediately and wept bitterly. He knew. They bound Jesus and led him away to Pilate. And when Pilate heard that he was a Galilean, he sent Jesus to Herod. Herod who ruled Galilee. 
And Herod questioned him, and when he wouldn't answer, Luke 23 says, Herod with his men of war treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate, dressed as a king. Pilate gave in to the passions of the crowd and passed over Jesus for release in favor of the murderer Barabbas. Even though Pilate knew that the Jews were only driven by envy, the, in envy, the text explicitly says that Pilate knew that this was all about the envy of the Jews, that this was an innocent man. And yet he gave in to the, the, the passions of the crowd. And, and according to the tradition that the Roman ruler would, would pardon and free a prisoner, he passed over Jesus for that. And pardoned and freed Barabbas the murderer. The crowds, the Jewish people, screamed, let him be crucified. When Pilate resisted, they screamed louder, let him be crucified. Until Pilate gave way, the professing people of God, screaming for the Messiah to be crucified. Pilate had Jesus scourged and delivered to be crucified. We live in the modern times. We don't know what it means to be scourged. You are scourged with a scourge. A scourge is an instrument, a handle with multiple straps of leather, not, not, a, not a belt, a single broad strap. No, a handle with multiple straps of leather, often with some hard object, a shell or a piece of metal tied at the end of each strap because it is a flesh tearing device. When you had been scourged, your flesh was torn. That was the point. Jesus ended that with his back opened up in a hundred places and running with blood. The Roman garrison, this group of soldiers gathered around him and stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisted a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and they bowed mockingly, hail king of the Jews, then they spat on him and they took the reed, their play scepter that they put in his hands, they took it from his hands and they struck him on his head on the crown of thorns. And they led him away to be crucified. And when they came to a place called the place of a skull, they crucified him. No Roman citizen could be crucified. No, no citizen across a 1500 mile breadth empire, no citizen could be crucified. It was too cruel. It was too humiliating. It was too dehumanizing for a Roman citizen. They crucified the Lord Jesus. And the soldiers who crucified him, who, who drove the nails through the bones in his wrists to hold his weight, who drove the nails through his ankles, those soldiers, they also mocked him. If you were the king of the Jews, save yourself. Save yourself from this nail. Save yourself from this nail. Save yourself from this nail. They put a mocking inscription over his head in three languages, Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, so that anyone who could read would go by, who went by, would read it. This is the king of the Jews. See what happens to fake kings. See what happens to fake kings. We'll hang you here too. They crucified two robbers with Jesus, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. The chief priests and the scribes and the elders also mocked. He saved others himself. He cannot save. 
If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusted in God. Let God deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. They're dying too, to his right and to his left. And they reviled him. They were really guilty of these crimes and they reviled him. Jesus was forsaken by his father who he had been in unbroken unity and unbroken communion with from eternity past. His father forsook him from eternity past. Jesus had been in unbroken unity and unbroken communion and unbroken fellowship and unbroken love with his father. His father forsook him on the cross. Jesus quoted Psalm 22, 1, a Psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at last, after three hours of darkness, the sun went dark. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, it is finished, and yielded up his spirit. And to make sure that he was truly dead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came flowing out. Extraordinary treatment. Study his life. He deserved this treatment less than anyone who ever did live, anyone who is living now, anyone who will live. If you took all humanity and brought them before God and God said, I will, I will spare one from this treatment. The rest must have this treatment. I will spare one. You would, you would pick Jesus. You would pick Jesus not to be treated like this. You would pick Jesus not to die like this. His mission was a saving mission. He came to save. Overwhelmingly, his miracles were miracles of mercy that demonstrated that he is the Savior come to save. They were mercy miracles. The blind saw and the deaf heard. The lame walked. The mute spoke. The dead came forth from the grave. His teaching was perfect teaching, no error, all truth, the voice of God. He fulfilled all the law and all of the law can be summed up in one word. That's what Paul says. All of the law can be summed up in one word, love. So who was the most loving person who ever lived or is living or will live? Jesus was the most loving person who ever lived. They treated him this way. They killed him for his love. How could such a man be a threat? How could such a man be hated? How, how could such a man be so humiliated and so treated? How could you kill such a man? This is the suffering and death of Jesus Christ according to the Gospels. Number two, the meaning of his suffering and death. What does it mean? What does it mean? Friends, if you ever have anyone tell you, this is an, this is an example, we should be self-sacrificing. That falls a million miles short of the meaning of the death of Jesus Christ. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It's only one verse, but I beg you to turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. If you had to boil the gospel down, oversimplifying the gospel is a real risk. But if you had to boil it down, and put it in a single verse. I think Paul maybe has done it here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. The good news is here. But the bad news is here too. We need to understand them both. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul writes, For he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. For he, God, made Jesus, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God. This is often called the great exchange of the gospel. The great trading places of the gospel. The sinless Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, trading places with sinners. One who knew no sin all of his life long, being made sin for us, so that we could become the righteousness of God in him, taking on his righteousness, as we just heard from Newton. The sinless Jesus was made sin to make a way of peace for sinners. This explains the agonizing in Gethsemane. What, what, what was the, 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 the deep sorrow and agonizing in Gethsemane? Was it Jesus afraid to be crucified? No, no, many men have died bravely. Jesus was also the bravest man who ever lived. So Jesus didn't relish the thought of suffering. I'm confident he didn't relish the thought of crucifixion, but he was brave in the face of it. The thing that he was agonizing over was this being made sin. Taking sin upon himself and being forsaken by his father. Jesus said in Gethsemane, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Let this bitter cup pass from me. He's drawing on the word of God in the Old Testament. I <clears throat> don't turn there because I'm going to attempt to move fast. Listen to Jeremiah 25 verses 15 through 18. So if you'd like, jot down the reference. Certainly, Jeremiah 25 verses 15 through 18. For thus says the Lord God of Israel to me. This is what God said to Jeremiah. Take this wine cup of fury from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it and they will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations drink to whom the Lord had sent me, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah its kings and its princes to make them a desolation, an astonishment, a hissing and a curse as it is this day. The cup in Gethsemane is the cup of Jeremiah 25. It is a wine cup of fury, the anger of God against the rebellion of man. That he makes the nations drink. Listen to Psalm 75 verses 6 through 8. Again, if you'd like to jot down the reference, Psalm 75, verses 6 through 8. We see the cup again. For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup. And the wine is red, it is fully mixed, and he pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. Again in Psalm 75 is the cup of his fury. It is ready, it is mixed. The wicked of the earth will drain and drink it down to its dregs. Do you know what the dregs are? The dregs are, are, are the leftovers of solid parts from the making of this drink. And it settles to the bottom. Because it has more weight than the liquid. It, the, 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 the dregs, the little specks, remaining parts, bitter, they're bitter. And they settle to the bottom. When you've drunk to the dregs, you've drunk to the last drop. Drunk all the way to the bottom. You have drained the cup. So the wicked will drain the cup. The wicked will taste the dregs. Listen to Revelation chapter 14. 
verses 8 through 11. Again, the cup, the cup, Revelation 14, verses 8 through 11. And another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image. And whoever receives the mark of his name, it is hell, it is hell, it is hell. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. This is the cup that the Lord Jesus took into his hand, figuratively, in Gethsemane. It is why he agonized. He had only known the pleasure and communion and fellowship and love of his father from all eternity past. Before the beginning of time, they, there they were, loving one another. And now the wrath of God against the wicked is upon him full force. Consider what Paul says in Corinthians 10, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, Paul is speaking of the Lord's Supper, the wine and the bread, the body and the blood, the cup and the loaf. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? He's calling the communion cup the cup of blessing. What does that mean? It means that the Lord Jesus Christ in the crucifixion took the cup of of the wrath of God against the wickedness of man. He was made sin. He drank it down to the bottom, to the bitter dregs at the bottom. He left not one drop and he hands you a cup of blessing. That's what it means. He took the, the cup of fury, God's fury against your many sins. You don't live an hour without a sin of the mind or the mouth or the body. You don't live an hour. You've never lived an hour. God says that all of our righteousness is like filthy rags. Just, just, just what Newton was preaching. Not, not, just, not the things that we're ashamed of. The things that we're proud of. Are filthy rags in the, in the eyes of God. You've sinned every hour of your life. God's wrath burns hot. It is an eternal wrath. Because he is a holy God. He drinks it to the dregs all the way to the bitter last drop. He hands you a cup of blessing. It represents his blood, which washes away your debt. Oh, marvel at the cross. <laughs> this is why John the Baptist saw Jesus and said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the innocent lamb to stand in to pay the price for the sinner. To die there at the altar for the, in the place of the sinner. Oh, put your hands upon the lamb. Transfer your sins to the lamb. Let him die in your place. This is why Jesus died on the Passover. He's fulfilling that. That was just a picture. All those dead lambs, none of that blood ever cleansed one sin. It just points us to Christ, whose blood cleanses from sin. 
1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Paul says, For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Think about the Passover. People of God, the, the, the people of God ready to come out of Egypt. That night, if you painted the blood of the innocent lamb on the doorpost, the destroying angel would pass over you. Not, not because there were righteous people in Israelite homes and wicked people in Egyptian homes. No. There were wicked people, there were sinners, there were rebels in all homes, there were traitors against God in every home, but the innocent blood would cause the, it would cause the destroying angel to pass over. And this was the eternal plan of God, which is why Jesus is called the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This is Revelation 13, verse 8. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. How could that be? He hadn't entered time and our world yet and given his life because God had determined that it would happen and God had promised that it would happen. And when God promises, it's as good as done. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth because it was his pleasure and he promised. In Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has been poured out on the New Testament church. Peter said that Jesus was delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. This is not God reacting. This is God planning and promising to redeem sinners. It was his determined purpose. He determined to do it because he pleased him. He purposed to do it because he pleased him. It was in his mind. It was foreknowledge. In John 10, Jesus says, Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. No one made Jesus go to the cross. It was his love for sinners. It was his love for his father and his will. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, I'll be reading verses 10 through 14. Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 10, Paul writes, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Think of that. Cursed is everyone without exception. Who does not continue in all things without exception. Continuing in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Righteousness through law keeping requires perfect, unbroken law keeping of all the laws. Do you want righteousness through law keeping? It's too late. It's too late for you. It's too late for me. Verse 13. No. Verse 11. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. That's that's life by law keeping the man who does them, the man who keeps the law, not the man who believes. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. There Jesus is on the cross, hanging on a tree, becoming a curse for his people, being made sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 
Paul in this text, Galatians 3, 10 through 14, says there's only two kinds of people. Those of the works of the law, you're cursed. Unless you keep all the law all the time. Or those of faith who receive the blessing of Abraham. What is the blessing of Abraham? He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. An external righteousness. Jesus' righteousness that was given to him because he threw himself upon the mercy of God. He believed God. All I can do is say with the psalmist, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Why? Why forgiveness with God? Is God not holy? Can God overlook sin? God could never overlook one single sin. God is so holy that his eyes cannot even look upon sin. How can this God forgive sin? It is the cross. It is the cross. It is only the cross. The gospel is not the good news of God overlooking sin. The gospel is the good news of God's willingness to divert the, the fury of his wrath against wickedness from the one who deserves it to an innocent substitute who is willing, the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't, don't ever think or say that God has overlooked my sins. No. No. God has punished every one of my sins. God will punish every sin that is ever sinned by every person who ever lived. They will bear the penalty themselves or there will be a substitute for them. There is only one mediator between God and man. There is only one acceptable substitute. It is Jesus Christ. Number three, the application of his suffering and death. Consider our present and future, whether you're a believer, whether you're an unbeliever, whether you are professing to be a believer, but you're not really a believer. That's a category in the Bible that is spoken of so frequently. There are people in this room who think they are Christians, but they are not Christians. There are people in this room who say, Lord, Lord, but unless there is a change, unless there is a new birth, he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. In a gathering of this size, it must be so. Jesus asked the question in Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let's answer that question. Because sinners deserve to be forsaken by this holy God. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Sinners are traitors. Sinners have committed treason against almighty God. We owe him all of and the best of our loyalty that we have loved ourselves and served ourselves. Sinners, traitors, deserve to be forsaken by God and left to the pleasure of the wicked. This is what happened to Jesus Christ. He was forsaken by God and left to the pleasure of the wicked. And they did their worst. As a traitor against God, I deserve to be betrayed by false friends and forsaken by true friends and denied by my closest friends. As a traitor against God, I deserve to be treated as a common criminal, not someone special, but hanging among the thieves. As a traitor against God, I, de I deserve to be slapped and spit on and beaten and mocked and blasphemed. As a traitor against God, I deserve to have the, the mob cry out for my death. And when there's resistance, they cry out louder and they cry out louder until they get what they're calling for. As a traitor against God, I deserve fake crown of, uh, fake crown of thorns on my head. And a mocking robe and a play scepter. 
and to be stripped and humiliated and nailed to a cross as a cursed one hanging on the tree. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Receiving my wages right in the midst of the other rebels. An inscription over my head mocking me as a fake king. Oh, you would be your own king. You would be king. And as I hang there for those who pass by to mock me and to die there forsaken by the God of heaven. With his back turned to me. When you read of the sufferings of Jesus Christ and his death, do not marvel. We become so desensitized to sin. We think my sins are small, but their sins are great. It's treason against God. He is holy. Sin is utterly sinful. God hates sin. He has mixed a cup of fury for sin. Your sin, the sins you're comfortable with, the sins that you think are lesser sins. Marvel that you can go free. Marvel that there is a way of escape. And the one with the cup of fury is the one who made it for you. We deserve that God would not wait another moment. Deal with that traitor. Deal with his treason. Don't let him sin again. Don't let her sin again. She'll only sin more and more. The mountain of her sin will only grow. Don't wait another second. You are holy. But instead, God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, sent his son to bleed and die to reconcile us to himself, to deal with our sin. That we might know adoption instead of being forsaken. Not only is God not turning his back away and letting the wicked do their worst. He said, you are mine. You are mine. Not to bring us in even as slaves. What a privilege to be a slave in this household. But as a son or a daughter. That we would know life instead of death, not just an earthly life, not just an earthly death, but an eternal life of joy in his presence. Instead of an eternal death of agony for debts that can never be repaid, debts that will never be repaid. To know blessing instead of cursing. He took the curse. He was cursed. To know heaven instead of hell. The terms for our peace were purchased on that cross. They're such simple terms. Repent and believe the gospel. Turn away from your unbelief and throw yourself upon him for his mercy in Christ. Forsake every other hope. This is a scandalous gospel. The man who Newton was just, just teaching about, who want to redefine the righteousness. That, that gospel is too scandalous for them. They want to add something of their own. They will not be separated from their pride. We'll not take any of our pride to heaven with us. If you'll not part with your pride, you'll not be saved. If you'll not believe what the Bible says about you and your real condition and that there is a cup of fury against your sin that God has made ready. And if you don't repent, he'll make you drink it down to the last bitter drop. Not one drop will be left in that cup. Jesus bought peace on the cross. He bought peace. Father, I thank you for sending your son, the very God, truly God, 
very man, truly man, a spotless lamb who could bear your anger against sin. For those of us who have run to him for refuge, just keep us running to you. Day after day, pleading for grace, pleading for fresh mercies. For those who stand with the cup of your fury mixed and full, in their own pride, in their own self-sufficiency, traitors against you, I pray that you would be merciful to them, that you would move in their hearts. Because you are a merciful God, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.